says overall. Actually, I'm going to go back downstairs. I'm going to log in uh, and I'll watch, I'll watch from downstairs to make sure everybody's working remotely. Thank you. Remotely, okay? okay, good. Thank you. And if you. there's a problem, I'll come up. Okay. 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 Otherwise, we don't hear from it. Let's be good. Okay. I respect that. That's understandable. I guess relative. Relativity. Yeah, yeah. I'll be sad. I'm going to have a ton of scenes. So, um, mediations has brought us together again, and today it seems to be a full house. Good evening, everyone here and people online. Um, it's nice to see everyone. But before we start today's talk, here is a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lunapewa, and Chonongton nations on lands connected with the Landing Township and Sombran Treaties of 1796, and that is with one spoon covenant one point. This land continues to be home to diverse indigenous peoples, First Nations, Metis, and Imi, whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. And here is the bio of our speaker for today, Brittany Melton, taking us through how female celibate groups, that's femme cells, because societal norms and the agenda identity and sexuality on record. Brittany, as we affectionately call her, is currently a third year PhD candidate in media studies at Western University. She has successfully completed her field exam and will submit her dissertation proposal in December 2023. That's very specific, December 2023, <laughs> under the supervision of Dr. Suzanne Knabe. Alongside her research, she functions as the Media Studies Grad Student Association President and our FIMS Executive Committee Representative. Brittany, we are so lucky to have you and then hear your audience. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much for that. Uh, it's funny writing something and then having someone else read it and as if I didn't write it. Um, so, and also a weird moment to be back talking in mediations because I first saw a call for mediations come out when I was in my first year of my PhD in 2021. And I uh, immediately thought, I guess I should sign up for that. I think I probably should. I think we're supposed to do that. I didn't really know what it was. Um, and apparently, wasn't very typical of a first year student to do at the time. And it uh, I really had nothing to share because I hadn't done any research yet. And I still feel like I'm sharing research that's not done yet. So again, uh, but this full circle moment of coming back to the same topic again, a year and a half later. So today I'm presenting um, the conclusion of my comps exam or my field exam. If you're in media studies, you have to complete a field exam and the PhD, and then you are to do a public presentation. So this is the ending of my comps exam that I finished back in the end of September, actually. Uh, so, oh, is this gonna work? There we go. Okay, so a little overview of what I hope to do today. Um, a more bird's eye view of my project as I see it both in all of my comps fields, kind of bringing you up to speed, but then also my dissertation project as a whole. 
as I'm kind of navigating through questions for my research proposal that I'm hoping, as Evan said, to submit in December. I can add who's in the waiting room. Oh, you got it? Thank yeah, you. Got it. Okay. Uh, and then at the end, obviously, there'll be a question and answer period. Um, cool. Okay. So uh, overall, my goal is to, uh, for my PhD dissertation, is to look at Reddit, specifically fem cell groups on Reddit, and that's female celibate communities. And this is how they talk about societal norms surrounding gender, uh, gender identity, and sexuality. And to me, this is extremely fascinating stuff. Uh, fem cells are self-defined as women who complain about the superficiality of men and the privilege of pretty women and to share their experiences moving through the world in an unattractive body where they're, uh, which therefore disadvantage them romantically, socially, and economically. So at the heart of my research, there are kind of two things that I'm dealing with. The first is that uh, how do the members of the subreddit Female Dating Strategy or FDS use Reddit as their go-to spot for gender-related conversations? And second, how do the moderators of that subreddit use Reddit's affordances? Specifically, how do they use that to shape the kind of gender expression that's allowed in the group? Uh, and potentially, how do they radicalize members in the process? Um, and so my key questions uh, that I have kind of guiding my work at this point right here are, uh, why do you, FDS users pick Reddit for these discussions? How does it mold their gender identities? Uh, in what ways does Reddit let its moderators potentially push their communities towards radical views? And how does, uh, oh, how does having a shared identity help form unique groups or counter publics on Reddit? Uh, so. With that being said, that is like, this is my dissertation broadly, um, but I wanna start by talking a bit about my comps. And I made sure to make this not just about my comps because otherwise I do think this would have been really boring. <laughs> so uh, for those of you who don't have to do a comps exam, uh, a comps exam starts with these three fields, the outset, the cultural theory, a medium theory, an elective field that I got to choose, fill in with a book list, and then I had to read them all and write a section on each, defend, and then present. Uh, and so when I went into my book list, I started with counterpublics, just platforms, basic platforms, and post-structuralist feminist interventions, which is a mouthful. Um, and then lastly, once like I submitted my final exam, I actually ended up with a fourth, um, and they all kind of looked a little different except for counterpublics. I ended up with affordances, more specifically, I wanted to understand how platform affordances and features specifically uh, control and constrain the way that people act on the platform. Um, gender and matter, which actually ended up more broadly being performativity versus performance. Um, and then lastly, ethical approaches to internet research. And I'm gonna go through each of these, but clearly like it's just a process. <laughs> Things changed along the way. Um, and really where I come out of is that there are these major oscillations between all of these things of are uh, the fem cells a community or are they a counter public and you have to argue for either one. Uh, is it is the gender that they're performing online? Well, is it performance or is it performativity? And are platform affordances on Reddit shaped by social forces or are they shaped by the technology? So is there agency or is it tech deterministic or is it somewhere in between? Uh, and none of these are simple yes, no questions. They're all about exploring the spectrum of possibility that's there. And so my goal is to uncover where the fem cells fit in that spectrum and how those elements, the platform of work with gender and counter products potentially play together. So um, my field one was counter public specifically, but let's just like take a moment to start with Jürgen Habermas who coined the term public sphere to talk about a social realm where public citizens could engage in rational discussions about common interests free from government control and on economic pressures. And this is back in the 60s. This was this idealized place where we could have this great thought that was not the government and it wasn't economic. It was the space just for the people. And Nancy Frazier first and then Michael Warner later come in and they contest this idea. They say that space is bad. I don't, I want to say bonk. I don't know if that one's really a great way to describe this. Basically, um, the space of the counter public was conceived of to kind of rationalize what it would look like if there was going to be more than one public sphere. And in that it is to challenge this idea that it was mainly white bourgeois, uh, bourgeois men, leaving out women, non-white men and lower social strata men. 
uh, Fraser's critique here is that the idea of a singular central public sphere doesn't cut it when it comes to the idea of inclusivity in participating in rational debate. So who was included uh, in rational debate? So Fraser went on to suggest the sub counter uh, subaltern counter public as a means for marginalized communities or marginalized groups to create parallel discursive arenas or counter publics uh, that would craft counter discourses uh, to redefine identities, interests, and needs. And obviously important here is that their identities were actually highlighted rather than ignored. So in uh, Habermas's idea of the, count, uh, the public sphere, we had the idea of bracketing where people were expected to bracket their private identities and enter the public sphere as public individuals, um, which in this, in this sense is kind of a masculinist bourgeois view of like, ignore the fact that you don't have privilege and you're poor and you're a woman and we don't consider you a human. Uh, and that's what you need to do in order to actually speak with us. And so Nancy Frazier instead argues that, wait, 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 we actually should be bringing in and talking about these issues as part of an alternative or counter public sphere. So um, part of my research is even to just define if we can use the term counter public when talking about fem cell groups, because they are contributing counter discourse to the larger hegemonic discourse that is being spread on Reddit. However, it's not necessarily a more positive discourse. So there's work to be done. Uh, field two, which was the one that started out as just platforms, by the end, really focused on platform affordances. And so affordance is this term coined by James Gibson in the realm of ecological psychology to talk about affordances between animals and the environment. So animals perceive the affordances of fire as earth, light, and cooking. Um, affordances are measured in relation to the animal, but affordances don't change, the observer does. So affordances in this situation, they don't cause behavior, but they constrain and control it. So we're constrained and controlled by the amount of water if we're able to use the fire. Um, but in my work, because since this point, actually, there's like uh, 11 or 12 definitions of affordances that have cropped up since that point in time to talk about in media studies, in uh, a realm of social science and humanities to use affordances in modern day. Uh, so I would like to use the term social affordances that talks about, uh, can accomplish, no, uh, to take into consideration a lot of different human interactions. So this can help explain how people use and adapt technology. So this moves away from this tech deterministic view, which is that the technology completely constrains or, con uh, or controls the, uh, the person using it and instead looks to how potentially there's a bit of a back and forth happening that both the technology does constrain and control the person using it, but it also goes the other way and that we adapt the technologies that we use for our own means. Um, and so my dissertation then wants to zero in on specifically Reddit because there is an importance when we're talking about affordances that we we can't just broadly talk about platforms in general. Like we can, there are things that go across lots of platforms like liking and commenting, but every platform has specific things that bring you to that platform. And that is especially true in the case of the fem cells. There are very specific affordances that bring them there, like the ability to use flares, upvoting and downvoting, um, the anonymity that is afforded by Reddit. And so these are the specific things that we're looking at when we're talking about affordances uh, on Reddit. So lastly of my main three, I had my elective field and I needed that to be gender because uh, gender to me is my main field, but um, the concept of gender, we really narrowed it down between Susan and I, it was post-structuralist feminist interventions. Uh, and I read a lot of Judith Butler's work spanning four decades, it's a lot, and kind of came to just this broad discussion of uh, gender as performance or performativity, especially when it's happening in the online world. So as we've seen with gender studies, it's come a long way from uh, scholars like Simone de Beauvoir really trying to situate that one is not born a woman, it, rather we become one, and to situate that gender is different and separate from biology, uh, but also to suggest our identity is shaped by both. Um, but then Judith Butler takes this idea further to talk about the idea of constituting acts where performative, there's the performative nature of gender. It can't happen in just one act, uh, it, but it's through multiple consistent acts, thinking like dress, the way we talk and move uh, that create the illusion of a consistent gendered self. 
So Butler is all about the interplay between body and identity. Uh, she says gender isn't about what we do once, but repeated actions and behaviors uh, that form social norms. And so this is also very interesting when we get into the online space where the body isn't present. Um, but there are many things that we do, these constituting acts that do are replicated in the online space. Uh, and so gender isn't, gender identity is not fixed. It's shaped by ongoing practices. They're both conscious and unconscious. Butler's idea of performativity is about enacting social conventions, often without even realizing it. It's quite unconscious, whereas uh, the idea of performance is actually quite conscious. Like when we're performing on a stage, we are quite conscious of what we're doing. Um, so Butler's work reshapes how we think about gender because it's not just about identity or about sex. It's actually about how we repeatedly act within a societal framework and how that shapes our gender identity. So I'm going to speed run through that. Okay, so um, after with that being said, I want to take a pause. So this was my original presentation I gave back in winter term of 2021 in mediations in this room, standing here. Actually, no, it wasn't. I was online. <laughs> <laughs> that was a beautiful thought though. Um, so uh, before, like that was my, those are my three fields. That was my last year of my schooling, but this is actually taking place in the first semester of my first year of grad school. I had just done my theory course and I came out and changed my dissertation topic because I wrote this paper and was like, there's not enough. I can't say everything I want to say here. I need to keep going. So I changed my dissertation topic, but from this point, and I want to just say like a lot has changed in terms of how I'm approaching my work. And this is kind of moving forward through the rest of my presentation. What has changed is these points. But um, in this presentation, I presented a case study on female dating strategy. So the same group that I continue to want to look at um, through a critical discourse analysis of the rules and the handbooks that they have on their on their subreddit. Uh, this was part of this coursework, and so uh, through this, I kind of went through and talked about um, how gender identity was shown in the group, and I didn't want to get into the daily interactions because I didn't have an ethics clearance or anything like that, uh, and so this to me felt like a good kind of dipping my toe in, uh, but there's a lot going on in that group. So. After this, I uh, went on to take Sophia Locklear's uh, Indigenizing Methodology and Alyssa Santavani's Information Ethics, which both really changed how I went about doing my research. These were my later courses that I took. And then in addition to that, I started working and still work as a research assistant for Jackie Burkell on an internet research ethics project. And all of these things have genuinely really changed the way, because I've had to do a lot of critical reflection about how I intended to do my research. I intended to just go in, actually I can also owe some of this to Melissa's class, the doctoral seminar, where we had these critical conversations about just taking data and just using data that you find online, this found data, and how uh, there's not necessarily ethical policies in place right now in Canada to stop you from doing that, but there should be maybe a moral and ethical responsibility to not do that. Um, and so from that point, I kind of gone back and within my comps exam, as I was building my book list, I was like, I need to add in ethics. And this came in multiple forms. It was adding in indigenous methodologies. It was adding in, um, it was adding in internet, uh, ethics methodology, and it was adding in feminist ethics of care. And so all of these things were getting kind of woven through my books, my book list as I went. And then at the end, I was like, I actually just need a fourth field. This isn't a big enough exam. So I added a fourth field and that was ethics. So when I submitted my exam, it had a special fourth field and that was ethics. So I kind of tried to condense this because even submitting it in my comps list and in, in my comps exam, it was kind of all over the place because we have everything happening in indigenous methods, everything in methodology and um, eth feminist ethics of care and <laughs> internet ethics uh, or like ethics surrounding data research. This is a lot. And so I went forward with just labeling key issues or in key terms that should bring us forward and lead us things like researcher location uh how we define data how we define a, a human or a human subject these kind of like broader ideas to kind of lead the way and so 
originally I was really focused on just the toxicity of the text on the platform. And now moving towards a, an ethical approach to my methodology means really focusing on the people, uh, trying to question more why they're in the group in the first place, uh, why, you know, uh, does FemCell resonate with them or does it not? Um, uh, what kind of potentially, what kind of um, problems does that cause being labeled a FemCell? Um, in, including kind of interrogating my own assumption that uh, that fem cells are bad and going in and trying to uh, repair that by listening to stories and experiences. So with this, this is recognizing, first of all, that data is of the human, that is not removable, those things are together. Um, it's really easy in a pervasive data society to say uh, that there's the human subject that we have in like medical sciences, and then there's data. Uh, and these two things can be separated. And that I think is not a useful uh, model for us to use. And so instead, um, using Deborah Lepton's idea of lively data, lively data is just everything we do in our daily lives online. It might be like sending a like to a friend or an email or uh, posting a tweet. All of these things though are make up someone's life, especially increasingly with the pressure to post online so much that we should be uh, considerate about the integrity, the contextual integrity of that data. And so uh, Tidenberg has the concept, uh, where is it, is it up here? No, uh, contextual integrity, which really says that we may be looking across different posts, but depending on what's written in the post, we should be observant and aware of the, the, the uh, what's in the post uh, and how contextually that may differ and how that would change our ability to use it if we're trying to respect the privacy of the individual for the data that we're taking. So kind of broadly then, this functions into a ethics as method and method as ethics approach, which means that at all points in my study, ethics is there. It is my methodology, but it's also my method. It goes from my assumptions that I came in with. It goes through how I'm setting up my thing. It's been increasingly hard to set up an interview guide if I'm trying to do this ethically and also to do a critical discourse analysis. All of these things are both challenged, but also I think made stronger by doing it this way uh, because they're context sensitive, they're reflexive, they're adaptive. To me, they're respectful. Um, and hopefully to me, the big output of this would be that it's, it's a, a case study into how to apply ethics as a methodology in online research. There's others too, but like this would be a great example. Um, so my two methods, I think that this can potentially be boring, but I'm a methods nerd. So my two methods are uh, critical discourse analysis, which I'm using two different approaches to critical discourse analysis. That is technocultural and feminist uh, critical discourse analysis. So I made this little graphic to show you just kind of what critical discourse analysis looks like broadly, which is there is a textual level here. We have the text that is the posts on Reddit or photos on Reddit, depending on what style they're creating. Um, never videos. Uh, from here, we get into uh, interpretation of the text at the discursive level. Uh, we look at thematic patterns and hope for deeper insights into what's going on between different texts and also within the text itself, within individual texts. And then there's this third level, the sociocultural practice that offers us kind of broader context, broader societal context that is reflected within the discourse and influences the societal structures within the subreddit, within Reddit itself. A lot of this is that Reddit has a lot of in speech and so does the subreddit itself has so much in speech. So understanding this is a broader context that you would apply to the work that you're doing. And then lastly, we have these technocultural and feminist approaches to critical discourse analysis. Uh, a technocultural approach focuses on understanding how discourse and technology and user interactions are all wound together Particularly, this is useful for understanding how technology shapes discourse. So how posting on Reddit rather than potentially speaking face-to-face -face, could shape the way that we speak or the way that we interact or share our gender identity. Uh, and this is obviously aided then with uh, Michelle Lazar's concept of feminist uh, critical discourse analysis, because this is looking specifically at how power in gendered relationships is communicated discursively. And so then in this case, we can see gender both as like these patriarchal practices potentially actually being shared within women in this space, um, but then also the ways in which uh, women are kind of discussing these issues, discussing their gender identity as well. Uh, and this 
on both, they go also to the way the study is structured, the way I use technology, the way that I am, uh, my assumptions about gender going into my research. So that's interesting. However, there is one very large uh, limitation towards critical discourse analysis, and that is it has the potential to extremely oversimplify these big ideas, social issues, and, and context. If you don't have context, it may be hard to get it from looking at posts or from looking at the text. And so I'm hoping that to supplement that, I will conduct interviews. And so with my interviews, I just started from, I had recently written a short application and I started from those questions I wrote, my, my research questions that I wrote for my short application. And I went from there and I broke down within each question, which and within each of those questions, how I could go potentially about answering it more generally or get at even a part of the question in an interview, specifically a semi-structured interview. Um, and so the goal of this is to have online interviews just with both members and moderators of uh, female dating strategy to talk about more generally how they came to the community or the group, how do they feel like they're part of it, a sh like a group, uh, a shared identity, do they have those moments, uh, and, and also if not, um, but then also these concepts of like uh, you know, have you been called a fem cell to identify as a fem cell? These questions as well. And this is to kind of get at this dual tone of often fem cell is a self-defined term. In this case, it is not. I have my own hypothesis as to why that is, but I would like to hear from users themselves why they don't call themselves fem cells. So looking forward um, to my research trajectory, is uh, obviously I'm I'm doing a lot here. There's a bunch of different theoretical frameworks, and there's a uh, there's quite a bit of methodological work happening here. But they all, to me, come together really nicely, and they weave together because on one hand we have gender and affordances and counterpublics, which are all uh, they are all made up by discourse. They're constituted through discourse. And so that to me is incredibly important. And on, on the other hand, then we have this happening through uh, an ethical framework for my research. And the big picture here is just to understand this through those ethical considerations. Um, my dissertation is not just about looking into complexities of things like digital activism or gender representation. It's about looking for uh, inclusive social media research practices and doing things uh, the way that I think is potentially better than the way I had hoped to and encouraging others to do the same. Uh, and then looking also to how potentially we can use platforms to amplify voices. However, obviously, and as I said earlier, there is this assumption out of, out of counterpublics research, namely through thinkers like Fraser and Warner, that counterpublics are these really positive things, specifically out of gender studies and queer studies, that they offer greater democracy and sharing and diversifying voices. However, uh, because the kind of content that's being shared is, is a bit toxic and um, it's often transphobic and uh, misandrist, uh, potentially that is not the case. And, and I think that's gonna take a little bit more work too. So, um, with all that being said, my my final piece is just, I don't know if this is interesting to anyone, but I wrote this and it took so long. This is my timeline to defense. <laughs> and <laughs> it starts from next semester. I have to go through REB approval for this project. I'm almost done writing my REB, uh, my submission uh, in, in, in line with writing my proposal, which I hope to submit by the end of the month. And then I, plan to start. I already have a whole body of work that I collected for a critical discourse analysis previously. And from that point, co continued collecting data uh, just in case, because I know that this is a volatile site to do a project. So I had been collecting, saving manually sites uh, from Reddit for a year. So now I have this year, this body of text. Uh, and so I hope to start reviewing it and writing alongside conducting interviews in summer, writing, more writing, and then getting into uh, analysis by fall of next year. So with that being said, I think that's everything. I'm gonna flip really quickly to my references because I made this, but then I think I can stop sharing. <laughs> So now is our questions and answer uh, period. And thank you very much, Bernie, that was awesome.
I will start if I may, and I and I say I may, therefore I'll start. Okay. <laughs> How does anonymity in a forum like Reddit shape the performative nature of the discourse? I.e., if it wasn't anonymous, yeah, what would the discourse look like? Well, I think I, I mean to be honest, I, I'm going to start and give you an honest answer, which is that is part of the research to be done yeah. is to see speaking with uh, users how they feel anonymity shapes how they're able to share. Um, because there's also potential that people aren't sharing exactly what we would call like our offline or our real identities, but we're sharing whatever we feel comfortable to share in an anonymous space. Um, but then on top of that, there are studies done that that discuss that an anonymity usually affords people that there's more cyberbullying and more toxicity because there's more freedom. That makes sense. I have a friend who is a very the gentlest person possible in person. But I know online he's a, he's a, a bully, and uh, it's interesting how people have these these different personalities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I don't I don't think it's a good thing. I find it very annoying. But uh, um, it's like you know I know who you are. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Yes, really. Um, you, so you had on your slide that you were on the final slides that you were using you're using in vivo. Yeah. Uh, to code, are you planning on? doing, are you planning on taking that back to the people that you interview and saying like, this is what I found. Are you okay with it? So I do think that that is part of an ethic, like that comes more out of uh, an indigenous methodology. And I do think that that is important is like kind of working from center is this like, um, I can honestly say, and I think that this is an important starting point is that I'm not within the community that I'm studying. I feel like that's probably a shocker to people. Every time I say study fem cells, they're like, are you a fem cell? <laughs> I'm like, I don't think so, but I'm not, I'm not actively participating in the community. I am part of it by the fact that I've been in it for a year or two now, but I do think it is important to share your research comp contributions. And it is something that's written into my ethics process at this point is that I would bring it back to them to share and say, this is what I've written. Um, now it becomes more complicated because of the toxic nature of the group. Uh, and I, I'm aware of that and how that may make things harder. But at the same time, I don't think it's any less relevant. I think it's, there's like this uh, trade-off where people who often that I've read who study toxic groups online, like incels or the manosphere, uh, think it's fair game because they're, they are sharing bad things. But I think it's important to understand how they, why they join these groups in the first place, rather than just being like, well, they they said this bad thing online, so let's take everything about them. So, yes. Someone else. There's one question online. Oh, yeah, there's a question online. Are you, are you, I, can, I can read it. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Are you looking at all at fem cell commentary that sometimes happens outside of the FDS subreddit? I actually think that's really important, yes, because um, as of now, the way that FDS has been constituted as a fem cell group has been primarily through popular media and Reddit users. So if you don't use this as a basis at all, uh, then there's nothing to say that they're fem cells. They talk about being called fem cells, but they say, we're not fem cells. Um, but the proof as of right now is just that they're not called fem cells genuinely is like the one difference at this point um and so part of this research is to kind of understand if, if there are genuine differences between what they're sharing which maybe then puts them into just a broader femosphere of like women going their own way which exists uh the pink pill uh gender critical feminists like all of these different groups rather than just being fem cells um to to make sure i can constitute that they are in fact part of themselves some of these words, these these phrases like women going their own way sound like phrases I've heard from my guy friends over a beer, except instead of women, it's guys going their own way. Like yeah. to what extent are they are we looking at parallels? They are very parallel. Yeah. Uh well, what you're talking about is the manosphere. Yes. <laughs> which the incels are part of. And then a lot of what's happening, and I I think femosphere is not really actually a, a coined term, but I've heard it from uh, my idol. And the only other scholar I know doing this research is Jilly Boyce K out of uh, Leicester in the UK. Uh, she has been using the term the femosphere to discuss women going their own way uh, and gender critical feminists and female dating strategy and the fem cells, like all of these things broadly. Interesting, yeah. yeah. Anyone uh, either online or in person? Yes, your uh, aunt. Well, I'm oh, sorry. There's one online. There's one online. Yeah. Thank you. Can you read it? To... Okay, well, thank you. Because then I get to see it. Yes. 
Uh, FEMSA members surprised you as you've read or have, they, oh, sorry. Have or how have fem cell members surprised as you've read or interacted? Uh, well, at first I was just am genuinely amazed right off the bat by the terms they use, um, both because they were kind of humorous. Um, <laughs> they were using words like pick me show to talk about um, women who they didn't like and who just wanted men's attention. And then they also used words like low value man to discuss men they didn't like. Um, so it was like incredibly like rich lexicon of terms that they use, which I think is incredibly interesting. But then also, um, I, th I think that what's now surprised me, so that's like my original surprise when I first kind of stumbled in there. And then now two years later, it's that I think more increasingly, I can see that there's just story there. There's a lot of like hard experiences people have gone through that have brought them into the space. And I think that there's radicalization happening that is kind of souring the situation a bit, but that people are going there for help or self-help. They feel um, like they don't know what to do. And so they enter these groups in order to find help and then kind of get spun, spun badly. Yeah. So, yes. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Um, this is just an invitation to speculate. I yeah. <laughs> Don't don't take this as well, haven't you done this research? Um, in your in your if you've been watching this this you've been monitoring this for over two years now yeah. have you not? Have you noticed that the level of discourse, particularly the level of toxicity, changes with corresponding things happening? outside so because we've 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 the, the world has been going through some very very uh severe changes sure. like do you do you have you noticed that say um after the outbreak of the war in the middle right. east that the that the level of intensity the level of anger mm -hmm. the level of hostility rises as if as if it sort of what used to be a positive right. counter counter um discourse sure. has become increasingly angry. I actually think I've seen kind of ups and downs of like, uh, not necessarily from the outside world, but like, sadly, just within Reddit, like, it seems like that's the one thing everyone all knows what's going on is what's going on on Reddit. And that's something else that I was working on with Alyssa Santavani. So I've been kind of looking at that as well, is as there are these major changes on Reddit, the users get angry, and they're really frustrated. And that's typically when there are these things like their rules against bullying and rules against um, doxing and things like this happening within Reddit as a structure, and then how that affects the way that the community members talk to. And that's like directly following all of the fem cell and incel groups that call themselves that being removed for bullying and, and doxing and things like that. And this is the yeah. group left standing. Because because I belonged to uh, I belonged to an 18th century studies research okay. back in 2001. If you can imagine a more placid uh, <laughs> group of scholars sure. and when 9 11 happened the 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 discourse on that on that um that list sir just went really went toxic um it was like people would try every now and then something sacred when, well they would try to bring it back to you know uh, is anybody still interested in samuel johnson's letters you know and, and there and it would just be swept away with you know no. you need a terrible swift sword to you know I also yeah. think what happened, I think big things in pop culture also affect this. Um, and there'll be things that like specifically related, like they, they do try and keep this related to gender. I mean, to dating, gender dating, but like, uh, and heteronormative dating, but they, the issue of like when Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift hit the news, like this was an uproar mm -hmm. um, and talking about like why this is bad and like she's dating down and all of these things and using their terms to talk about the relationship. And so there's like, anyone be dating it now. <laughs> and ma yeah, these major like pop culture moments that offer them uh, something to discuss and to pick apart that they can, they can use, but then potentially cause actual toxicity because they're talking about it. Um, they are real people who... Yeah potentially you're in a really real relationship so there's all these things happening but I think it would be useful to look back and see like major world events as well and see if there's anything in That's line your next project <laughs> I can always have a second <laughs> it's probably very self-evident but to what extent the whole concept of being down like an inherently unhealthy concept like is there 
um, any redemptive value to the discourse that surrounds that, or is that inherently negative? I think that the, well, this now I think I'm just getting into personal opinion, but I think probably oh. the, the most important thing that is negative about that is that uh, it's it's positive when it's turned inward to say like self-improvement is a good thing and not just to date, but just like to feel better and be a better person and like have hobbies and don't focus on dating. Like these are some things that do come out of this group, yes. but in its negative, it's that everything surrounds dating and everything should be about um, uh, the the one percent of men that exists in the world that they label worthwhile, and then also that you need to work to be the one percent of women in the world that deserve to be in a relationship that's like coveted and golden and perfect. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's not inherently negative, but I certainly don't think it's it's not helpful. It's not. I don't think it's productive to speak that way. No, totally not. Well, statistically, it's not like we have one percent of men are in this room. So as disappointing as that is, at least we can be. Comforted in the in that reassurance, but Art, would you have a question? Yes. Um, I was wondering, since this is not really like a self-identified femsol group, but yeah. more about like dating strategies, advice. Um, do you find that there's any official or unofficial vetting process, or like are people kicked out of the group? Like, have you seen this kind of thing? Yes, yes, so much, yes. So also they are called a femcell group, but I have been like keeping track of when they make changes to their group, like the title and the rules. And there was a time where they had way more in line with femcell groups. And as soon as those groups got kicked off of Reddit, they started changing their language to be like, mm, not like that though. And it was really like a convenient timing that all of a sudden they were like, we are not femcells, like we are not transphobic, but also if you are trans, you are not invited to my group, get out, um, be born female, present as a woman, like these kinds of things, obviously be interested in heterosexual dating, um, but they have a whole set of rules and the rules then also have links to separate documents so you're expected to use the terms the terms include things like Misha, as i said uh that there's a whole list of them and if you're not using the terms right they can kick you out for that and they do this is one of the most moderated groups i think on reddit currently it's very policed um but also if they perceive you to not be a woman gone that's considered trolling um if there's a, a moment of being kind of like brigaded by what they perceive as being uh men joining their group, they will lock it down. Um, so it is highly policed. I think the moderators are really where I'm super interested to talk is kind of like, what's an average day for you moderating this subreddit? Like, how are you, what's your vetting process for removing this content? Because that is when we're talking about what Kevin said about um, what's happening online, this is what we're happening. The, the larger discussion in Reddit is like, I was removed for this for saying this happening in like a different subreddit. And there's a whole subreddit dedicated to hating FDS. So that's rife with <laughs> instances like this of the policing in the group. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, from what I understood, uh, I think the group is like an evolving group that people come and go are added or removed from the group. So what I was curious about is that you mentioned you wanna uh, in interview the users and also the moderators. So if a user is in a group and then they're kicked out of the group, are you still going to interview them? Do they, um, are they still a part of that right. uh, sample group that you want to look into? Or If they were when I asked, I would still interview them because they would still be an interesting, it'd be considered an edge case, but that's still a really important and interesting addition to the story is like, what happened? And again, story, what brought you there? Like those questions are still relevant. Because there is obviously a part of the population of people that go to this page that aren't users of that group at all, that will just kind of stumble on it and leave. But then there are the people who are dedicated to this group. And so my first goal is moderators. It, like that's my first, because they will be the first point of contact when trying to seek out interviews will be the moderators. And then from there will be, if and if that's if they approve it, there's about eight of them. If they approve that I can talk to their users, then I'd go to the users after. So, Brittany, I was curious, during your presentation, you mentioned a couple of times the idea of ethics as method. Yes. Yes. And, um, you know, when you hear of ethics, it's like, okay, I'm waiting to hear back the pain in the neck, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And you've, you've, to my mind, you've turned that upside down. Yeah. Why and how? And like, how do you, how are you embracing it as a method? Well, I think that's probably just 
the way we use the term ethics. Yes, ethics yes. is just a, is what we refer to the system that we have to go yes. through. The like annoying thing we have to do to be able to do our research is like basically just bureaucracy. But actually, like the the what's going on there is kind of the process that should be happening, and and I think does with a lot of people, but should be happening in the process of doing research as well as like what are the harms in doing this research, right? We talk about that um, and, and, and bringing that into my research, but that also means um, kind of like, it means no matter what I was going to uh, uh, submit this for an ethics review, um, but I'm trying to do a lot of that work first and also using, to be honest, our uh, ethics review boards in Canada don't do a lot in terms of social media research. Um, and so, until that point happens where there's like six good guidelines, then there's things like errors guidelines and it's good to start there and supplement and not just rely on kind of the, again, uh, the bureaucratic process. Yeah, it sounds like you're embracing the spirit of ethics whereby, you know, there's this new form of social media yeah. and you don't want to do harm, obviously. So you're embracing the spirit, not just viewing it as a nuisance to get around or avoid or unlike unlike certain western departments in the 1980s which all which will remain uh, unnamed yeah exactly yes. is there any other question pull it um i'm gonna think about how to ask this question but it has to do with feminist ethics of care yes. and also your own position in the research yeah. as a feminist researcher <laughs> and i'm i'm just wondering like how are you attending to yourself um, in that framework? Yeah, so part of that is is coming in and saying, like I was talking about this earlier, actually, with the last time I presented about female dating strategy, I actually was like, I feel concerned for myself, but I was not really approaching it in a nice way. And then also, so then I was scared when all of a sudden they wanted to join the call. It's like, why are they here? But now it's going back and trying to sort out how can I care for myself within the structure? Because obviously part of part of feminist ethics of care is caring for the participants. And a, a lot of this work is trying to figure out how to care for the participants. And for myself, when I looked into how other people who have done work with, specifically the incels is the most popular one, um, done research with toxic technocultures, how they've done care for themselves is to go in uh, anonymous like in terms of not using your own name using pseudonyms and then and when publishing also using pseudonyms uh, as a means of of um protecting yourself as the researcher and working in teams and not going in by yourself and so that's a discussion that would have to happen with my committee in terms of how comfortable they feel being listed on things uh, so it's not just me bearing the brunt of what potentially could happen, but they're also a less violent group than the incels and outright, they're less of an outright violent group. So another part of it is coming back to this, like everyone has wants and needs that need to be filled. And coming from that point, I think probably starts the conversation in a better place than coming in and being like, why are you offensive? Yeah. And can I just follow up? Because yeah. I think part of what I'm also thinking of though, is like you as the sort of the person who's doing the the interpreting and the, and the sense making and, and and in those ways also so you know caring for yourself um and so and then that i mean i don't there's lots of ways to do that but one thing is like to debrief with your committee and like sure. build that actually into your methods though um uh intentionally and also therapy like yeah, I mean, there are there are definitely ways and i think i i probably part of the reason that this is so i said case by case but also kind of constantly reflective is that nothing can be set in stone now because I don't know what it will look like once we start so it is about building it in so we know that it's there and then also being realistic that things can change too and I think that that's something that often when we go into an ethics review when we're talking about like the, the system in the university we think of it as like we do it they give us our reviews hopefully we're done um where this is much more of a like constantly stopping and being like how are we right now are we good okay we can keep going <laughs> and by we I mean me <laughs> So, and just constantly having that check-in point to make sure that it's not uh, getting too much uh, or or too heavy or anything like that. Thank is, you. is there a final question, either in person or online? Susie. Um, this is a bit of a methodology, methodology question uh, for the post. So what was, um, have you 
collected all the posts that you've decided to an analyze or is this like a continuous process? Like what is the scope of how you're- Scope? I, when I started collecting, it was every single week I would go in and collect the top 10 posts of the week and then all of the comments on that post. And I would take a screen grab of that and collect it and put it in. And so that would mean both a base page of what order they were in, right? Of like, and this is also useful for having timelines of like when they change things on their on their main page. Um, but then going into each individual post so I can gather like, what are the comments? What are the sub threads and all of that? Um, and so that was my process. I did a year of that. And I don't know if I want to continue and, and gather more in terms of it's now been two years since data collection happened. So that data set is actually kind of old now. Um, and so now that, I, because at that point I was collecting uh, after being told by Alyssa, which I'm so glad she did. And by Nick Dyer Witherford, they were like, you better be collecting because this could disappear at any point, like any day you could log in and it'd be like, this doesn't exist anymore. And so I want to have that data set in case, but I think potentially best is new data. Yeah. Update. Update data. The internet is very ephemeral. It is. It's not meant to be kept forever. This is kept for a long time. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, our thanks to Dean Lisa Henderson for sponsoring the FEMS uh, and the FEMS uh, faculty for sponsoring the, the mediation series. Uh, in no particular order, thanks to uh, Matt Ward, who's presently vacationing in Florida. Shout out to Matt for helping me with the uh, tech aspect. I think I remembered some of it. Thank you for Charlotte McClellan for coming upstairs for filling in the rest I did not remember. Thanks to Becky Blue for promoting and the FEMS grad library. Thanks to all FEMS graduate students who are here and the FEMS faculty. Um, and sort of non non films graduate students, and glad to see you. Um, uh, and thanks also to the rest of the films, uh, sort of the mediations committee, my co-chair Evan uh, Avery for the wonderful posters rather than my cartoon uh, or stick drawings. And thanks to the ever strong and faithful Cena. <laughs> and uh, next week uh, we are honored to have presenting Professor Grant Campbell on defining and classifying the Broadway musical in an age of AI. Grant's presentation is dedicated to the memory of our former films colleague and scholar of the Broadway musical, Dr. Jonathan Burston. So that's the same time, same place. Uh, our films, uh, sorry, our mediation series this term, um, as befits humanist and social scientists, strong on quality, a little light on quantity sometimes, but uh, so there's only two talks, but the talks we have this term are great. And then next term, we have a few lined up. And uh, so thank you for joining, and we hope to see you next week. Thank you very much. And thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.